Well, good evening, everybody. We want to thank you all for joining us for our Moon Tour again. My name is Kevin Mace. I am part of the outreach team here at the Frank N. Bash Visitor Center. We, of course, are part of the University of Texas McDonald Observatory. It's very good to have all of you here with us tonight. Again, this is a live program. We are recording this, so if you do have to leave for any reason during the stream, it is recorded on YouTube. You can come back and watch it any time that you would like. And I did want to also mention that uh, this is the final moon tour of this series, which was last Friday and tonight. And our next window for doing moon tours opens up on about July the 24th or so. We haven't yet set those dates, but be sure to keep an eye on our social media channels. Also our website at mcdonaldobservatory.org. We will have those posted a few days before we do the program. Also uh, shortly coming up, we will have a, another uh, solar viewing program led by my colleague, Joe Wheelock. And soon after that, we will also begin our deep sky tours again with my colleague, Stephen Hummel. So this is just one of several programs that we do. And again, we're very happy to have all of you here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we do rely upon your support to keep these programs going. Uh, the conditions tonight, if you were here on Friday night, we did not have exactly ideal conditions. Uh, we had basically totally cloudy skies, although I did notice the other night when I was done with the stream and opened this door over here to the west and looked out, of course, there was the moon. Uh, but we didn't get a chance to view the live moon on, on Friday, but we hopefully will have some live views of the moon tonight. Uh, speaking of which, I did want to show you what our current weather conditions look like. Now, this uh, map here is an infrared map. It shows basically the temperatures of the tops of the clouds. And where you see any color other than orange, that is some degree of cloudiness over Texas. And as you can see, there are quite uh, a number of clouds in southern Texas. If you look carefully on that map, I'm basically at the tip of the of the uh, finger there, the arrow pointing right at our location here at McDonald Observatory. So we will do our best to clear the skies up to provide you some live views of the moon tonight. As we always do during these programs, uh, we want to show you where we're located because we think out here we live in the best part of Texas. Um, my personal opinion, it's the best part of Texas, the most scenic part of Texas. What you're seeing there on the screen now is the summit of our highest point on campus here. That is Mount Locke. On the left is the 82-inch Otto Struve telescope. That was the first telescope put here back in, dedicated back in May of 1939. The telescope that you see there to the right, the larger of the two domes on Mount Locke, that is our second largest telescope here built in the late 1960s. It's our 107-inch Harlan J. Smith telescope. And if you look in the distance on that somewhat lower peak called Mount Folks, that gigantic telescope over there is our 10 meter or 394 inch Hobby Everly telescope, which is actively doing research uh, currently. That's the summit of our location, the highest point. I am down at the visitor center, which is that building that you see there. We have a beautiful amphitheater out behind the building some domes out there that enclose the 16-inch telescope that I will be using tonight, also a 22-inch telescope and a 20-inch telescope. These are the locations where we do our public star parties. Now, we do not yet have a date for when we will reopen for public star parties and guided tours. Uh, we, we will do that when it is safe to do so. Make sure you keep an eye again on our social media channels, also on the website. We will give you some notice as to when we will reopen. I'm in the dome there circled in yellow, which houses a telescope that I'll show you here in just a moment. I want to go over quickly what we hope to talk about with you tonight. We're doing the introduction for you right now. We always talk about the equipment that we use here in the dome. I'll, I'll be showing you those telescopes here in just a moment. We will do then a quick live tour of the moon's major features with low power views that show basically the whole moon and all of its features. Then we'll proceed into our discussion section, which is different for every single program that we do. And tonight we're going to talk about the moons in our solar system and also the cratering on the Earth's only natural satellite, our moon. Spend a little bit of time there in the middle of the program talking about those. Then we'll proceed to our live views of the high power moon, followed by some Q&A 
and resources for you to learn more about the moon. Now, I did want to mention that you should not wait until very late in the stream to ask your questions. We do have moderators standing by to answer your questions. Be sure and give them plenty of good questions tonight. Also, they will be selecting some of the questions to pass to me. At the end of the program tonight, I will be answering a few of your questions. So make sure you think of some good questions. Get those in the comments there. Get, get them in the chat window as soon as you can and either our moderators or I will answer some of your questions at the end of our program tonight. As we always do, I wanted to show you an up-close view of the dome in which I'm located. This is a picture I took during our last uh, sequence of moon tours. It's not a live view, but it shows the dome in which I'm located with the dome shutter open there. You can also see Mount Folks and the Hobby Everly Telescope in the background. It looks a lot more like that picture outside tonight, certainly than it did last Friday night. The equipment that we're using tonight, um, now you can't see it. In the background here, you're seeing the counterweight, which you see sticking out on the far right, lower right part of that image is actually a series of counterweights that balances the telescopes on the other side. We have two telescopes we'll be using tonight, a three inch telescope to give us our low power views. That is a wonderful low power, a short focal length refractor made by a company called Teleview in New York. We're also using for our high power views tonight a 16 inch reflecting telescope made by a company called RC Optical Systems. Now they're no longer in business, but we have one of their telescopes from several years ago giving us our high power views. If you look in that picture, the little things that you see on the back end of both of those telescopes, well, those are our cameras. They're very small, they have small USB cameras. Uh, cables coming out of the back of them. We're using two different cameras tonight from a company called Point Gray Research in Canada. We're using both a five megapixel uh, version of that camera for our high power views, and then we're using the two megapixel camera for our low power views tonight. All of that telescope equipment and camera equipment and all the counterweights and everything, that rides on a part of the telescope called the mount, which is what allows the telescope to move around to different parts of the sky and also allows for tracking to keep celestial objects in the field of view as the Earth spins. So that is the equipment we're using tonight. Now, I always want to point out that you don't need a high power telescope to get a good look at the moon. And during our former programs, I pointed out some of the small telescopes that I have, which are that sort of thing, at least available online for relatively low cost. But Tonight, I wanted to remind everybody that binoculars are a wonderful tool for doing astronomy. You can get great views of things like star clusters and nebulas and the Milky Way and even, say, the moons of Jupiter. If you have sufficiently powerful binoculars, you can see all the moons of Jupiter at one time or another. Now, to see star clusters and nebulas and even some galaxies, you will need a very critical component to go along with your binoculars and that is a dark sky. So something you already have at home likely is a great tool for doing astronomy. And I wanted to demonstrate how a view of the moon in binoculars might be. What you're seeing now on the screen is a wonderful free package of software called Stellarium. Stellarium is available for Mac OS, which we like around here. Also Windows and Linux. They have free versions of that software for all the different platforms that you might have. What you're seeing now, we've zoomed in on the moon, and this is a view of the moon that approximates how the moon would look in a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars. Now, when you say 10 by 50, what that means is 10 power, 10 magnifying the power, so the moon will look 10 times bigger through the, your binoculars than it would to your eye. The 50 part of 10 by 50 refers to how large in diameter the lenses in the end of the binoculars are. In the case of 50 millimeter binoculars, well, that's about two inches. That image of the moon that you see there, although small, would be large enough through your 10 by 50 binoculars to show you the largest craters on the moon. Now I'm gonna show you a different view using Stellarium here with a larger pair of binoculars. Instead of 10 by 50, this represents how the moon would look through a pair of 25 by 70. Binoculars. Now, certainly a pair of good pair of 25 by 70 binoculars are going to set you back a little bit more money than a pair of 10 by 50s. And you likely would need, well, not likely, you would definitely need a 
monopod or a tripod to put those 25 power binoculars on to see the moon. But the advantage of the slightly higher power, of course, is that you would see the moon even better. So that approximates how the moon would look through a pair of ordinary binoculars and a pair of somewhat extraordinary binoculars. Now I want to show you, as we always do, the low power moon, a view of the moon through our telescope. Now I'm kind of waiting here to see if we have a live view. Hey, dude, we do have a live moon. Look at that. It looks a little bit hazy because, well, I think we have some thin clouds. From where I am right now in the dome, the opening is over here. The moon is over there. I don't have a direct view of the moon, so I can't exactly see the moon. But I can tell by that view, and, and I can tell actually now that I can see the clouds moving across the moon, we do have some thin clouds. Let me see. Oh, almost right on cue. The clouds are parting. Let me see if I can brighten up that view a little bit for you here. Now, this is what we call the low power moon because you can see the whole moon in one field of view. I always like the low power view of the moon because you can see craters and get an idea of the size of those craters compared with the whole moon itself. Now look at that moon. I'm going to make one further little adjustment here for you. And I'm gonna turn on a little pointer so I can point out to you a few of these features on the low power moon. Now, probably the first thing you notice, generally the first thing that people notice when they look at a view like this, is that it looks rougher in certain parts of the moon than others. And in particular, along this line right here that we call the terminator, that is where the sun is rising. If you were standing somewhere along that terminator facing east, which is facing the direction that finger is pointing, you would be looking at the rising sun. Behind you, your shadow would be extending far to the west, and the contrast between you and your dark shadow would tend to make you very visible, as it does the craters that you see there near the Terminator. The, the roughness of that region, it's not necessarily that it is rougher, although down in the southern part, it is true that it's rougher there than it is in the middle. It looks rougher along the Terminator simply because the sun is coming out at a low angle to the surface, which does really bring out any terrain differences on the moon. Little bumps that stuck up on the moon or crater walls or mountains really show up a lot better when they're near the Terminator. You likely also notice some of those big dark patches on the moon. Now I'm very happy tonight that we have the Sea of Rain, this big circular dark patch that you see right here. We are missing a tiny bit of it over here in the west but we have almost all of the Sea of Rains, also known as the Imbrium Basin. It's a large impact basin that we're going to talk about quite a bit tonight in our first live view of the moon. That's the Sea of Rains. We also have over here to the east, the Sea of Serenity, kind of a roundish patch over here. We have the Sea of Tranquility over here. Always looks like Pac-Man to me. Do you see Pac-Man? If you see Pac-Man in the shape, the outline of the Sea of Tranquility, leave a, leave a message for us. I see Pac-Man. And then over here, we have the Sea of Fertility and the Sea of Nectar down here. And then the Sea of Crises over here. So in a low power view, we see mostly just the largest craters we see the, the big uh, basaltic lava flows that we call the seas. They're called seas because they look like they could be bodies of water. And after we learned that they weren't about 400 years ago, we'd been calling them seas for so long, the name had kind of stuck by that point. But they were all lava flows at one time. And they're very visible in this low power view. Okay, well, let's go back to our slide for just a little bit here. We always put up this slide during our moon tours, uh, just a, a, some basic statistics about the moon. And you can always go back and look these up later. Some of these we have featured during our discussion section in different ways. Uh, we're not gonna talk about all these tonight. Just wanted you to, to be aware of some of these stats about the moon. One of the things I wanted to, to talk with you about tonight is sort of the collection of satellites in our solar system. Now, during prior programs, we have talked about 
say, the relative size of the moon, given the other satellites, the moon in absolute terms is the fifth largest moon in our solar system. In relative terms, that is, as a function of the size of the planet around which it orbits, our moon is the largest moon. But in absolute terms, it's number five. I wanted to discuss with you tonight, though, sort of the population of moons that we see in our solar system. And on this slide, of course, you can see the sun there over on the left and all the recognized planets in our solar system. Sorry about that, Pluto. And I also then wanted to show you a really cool picture of the moon and the Earth. Now, the moon in this picture might look a little strange because you're seeing the backside, not the side that faces the Earth, but the backside of the moon. Now, not the dark side of the moon, because look right there, it's fully lit up. But that dark side uh, that we see sometimes can be that other side, depending on the phase of the moon that we see at full moon, that backside is the dark side. Now, the Earth and the moon there are not quite to scale. This was taken by a satellite called the Discover Satellite. The Deep Space Climate Observatory is a NASA satellite in, in conjunction with NOAA. And the moon there appears a little bit larger than it should in comparison with the Earth because the satellite is about a million miles away from the Earth, which puts it a bit closer to the moon than it is to the Earth. So, of course, the moon's going to look a little bigger there. In that image, you can also see North America. I see uh, Baja there quite distinctly right above Hurricane Dolores. Now, this is not the current view of the Earth and the moon. This was taken about five years ago back in mid-July of 2015. I just really like that picture of the Earth and the Moon. There are very few pictures we have, real pictures, that show both the Earth and the Moon together in space. Here's the population of moons in our solar system. Notice that Saturn is the winner here. Saturn is, is just by a hair. It is the winner at 82 moons, followed closely by Jupiter's 79 moons. Quite a bit down the list then would be Uranus at 27 and Neptune at 14. Now, Mars has two moons. Technically, Mars has two moons. They're, they're just fragmentary little worldlets, little asteroids basically that orbit Mars. But, you know, they're natural satellites. They've been there a long time. We do count them as satellites. They're really, really tiny. And it has two of those. And that leaves the Earth with one moon. Now, probably Mercury and Venus at this point are feeling very sad because they have no moons. They have no natural satellites. And uh, both Mercury and Venus have had human-made satellites, space probes, that orbited them, such as the Messenger spacecraft to Mercury and the Magellan spacecraft that orbited the planet Venus for a period of time. But those, that was a while ago. Those satellites are no longer functioning. But natural satellites, Mercury and Venus, have zero. Here is a graph, and I promise this is the only graph I will show you tonight, that shows the number of satellites discovered as a function of time. Now, if you notice over there on the left side of the graph near the bottom on the x-axis, about four. Well, it turns out exactly four moons were discovered back in 1610, and those were the moons of Jupiter. If you know who discovered the moons of Jupiter, the first four moons, give us a comment in the chat and we'll see if you're correct. And that's a pretty easy question, actually. A harder question would be when. And maybe I already said that. I don't remember. But uh, anyway, so 16-something they were discovered. And then you get a few here and there. In the uh, mid to late 17th century, a few, uh, well, a little cluster there, close to 1800, around 1850, a few more, 1900, a few more. Look at that gigantic increase in the number of known moons in our solar system as we get close to the end of the 20th century. And that, of course, was the Voyager spacecraft. Look at my shirt. I'm wearing the Voyager spacecraft on my shirt tonight. Voyager discovered several moons of the outer planets in addition to the Hubble Space Telescope, other space probes, large ground-based telescopes made a lot of discoveries. And so of that total number of moons, the vast majority of them were discovered just in the last couple of decades. Our other discussion 
topic tonight that I wanted to go over with you is impact cratering on the moon. Now, on Friday, when we did our program, there was a question about whether there are more craters on the Earth side or the other side. We now have both of those views, the Earth facing side there on the left for you, the far side of the moon on the right. The main difference between them is the absence of those big dark patches on the far side. There's a few patches, but not nearly as many. Now, that volcanism that occurred on the Earth-facing side that produced the seas erased, obliterated, covered up the craters that were there before. If you were to go way, way back in time before those lava flows had occurred, you would have found equal number of numbers of craters on the near side, the Earth side, and the far side. But because there was volcanism later on, it erased the, most of the craters on the Earth facing side. Now, while I'm here on this slide, notice on the far side that kind of darker feature that you see toward the bottom. We're going to see that again here in just a moment. So that is the near side and the far side of our moon. Now, craters span a gigantic range of sizes. On the left, that picture that you see was taken with an electron, a scanning electron microscope. It is a picture of a, a small portion of a rock that was collected on the Apollo 12 mission to the moon. And circled there is a crater, an impact crater left essentially by a piece of dust. That crater is about 10 microns. A micron is one millionth of a meter. That 10 micron crater, just for scale, a human hair, an average human hair is about 100 microns. So that little crater that you see on that rock from Apollo 12 is only 10% the width of an average human hair. That's just amazing to me to see that. Look at that picture in the middle. What you see there is data from a Japanese probe that shows elevations on the moon, basically, where the bluish and purplish regions that you see circled there are the lowest elevations. And that gigantic structure is what's recognized as the largest impact structure on the moon. It is known as the South Pole Aitken Basin. It's 1,600 miles in diameter. It's eight miles deep, and it includes both the highest and the lowest terrain on the moon. The Leibniz Mountains that you see there border the edge, sort just out of view of what we can see from the Earth, border one portion of the South Pole Aitken Basin. So that's sort of the range of impact structures on the moon. Microns across up to thousands of miles across. A lot of times when we did our moon tours, when we were open and eventually when we get to the point we can open up enough and start doing our lunar twilight programs again, we expect to get lots of questions. And I get this question just about every program I do about how many impact craters are there on the moon. This video shows 5,000 craters and only the 5,000 craters that in this view from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, only the 5,000 craters that are larger than about 12 miles. We do not know the exact number of impact craters on the moon, but roughly there are a million craters on the moon that are larger than one kilometer. That is about six tenths of a mile. And as the moon rotates around there, you can see those different craters lighting up. The color indicates their elevation with the lowest features in toward the blue end and the highest features there towards the red end. I just love that. How many craters we have on the moon. All right, let's go back and see what we have next. I think I know what we have next. Absolutely, we have some great views of the moon to show you. Now I'm going to switch back over to our live moon view. And we don't see anything. That could be because the camera has frozen up. Let me try to see if that is the problem. 
That is not the problem, as it turns out. I think the problem is clouds. Now I'm turning the gain, the exposure time, not the gain, I was wrong. The exposure time, I'm turning that way, way, way up to almost the maximum value. And you can see the moon in the background with the clouds moving in front of it. So at this current time, we do not have a clear enough view of the moon to use the live view, but that's not a problem, really. I'm going to periodically check the moon up there. I'm not seeing any clouds. In fact, give me just a moment. I want to take a quick look here. You know what? The moon is just in a little cloud. It's not in a big cloud. It's in a little cloud right now. So we're going to give it just a few moments. And until it gets better, I want to take you to like we did on Friday night when we had total cloud cover, I want to show you an image of the moon from the LRO. This is our, our backup view of the moon here tonight. I'm going to get rid of my picture there because I want to bring up some information for you. Now, just like we did on Friday, over there on the left side of the screen, you'll see a small view of the moon, which pretty much matches the big view of the moon right now. The yellow rectangle represents how much of the moon we can see in our high power telescope, our 16 inch telescope. And as we proceed to different parts of the moon, you'll see that little rectangle there move down lower, so more southern, uh, to more southern locations along the terminator of the moon. But until we get a clear view, I wanna start with our LRO view now, but first, you know, I need to zoom in on it to more closely approximate the actual view that we have will have hopefully shortly through our telescope and i want to start right about there now we begin our program this evening by returning to an old favorite mare imbrium the sea of rains that's mostly all of that big dark patch that you're seeing there on the screen Italian astronomer Giovanni Riccioli named the Mare Embrium on his 1651 lunar map. The sea rests inside of an ancient impact basin named after the sea itself. Mare Embrium is the second largest expanse of lunar volcanism after the ocean of storms, which is to the southwest of our current view. Former Brown and Sol Ross State University planetary geologist, Dr. James Whitford Stark, determined that Imbrium lavas at one time covered a bit more than 700,000 square miles on the lunar surface. 30 separate lava flows have been identified in Mare Imbrium by their unique spectral signatures. Scientists have determined the ages of each lava flow using crater counts. How does that work? Well, as time passes, the number of craters in a given area on the moon increases with age. Apollo and Soviet Luna samples provide a local absolute age for each site because samples were collected and tested. Crater counts at these sites were then used to develop a mathematical formula to predict crater values at any point in time, thus revealing their absolute or true ages in actual years. Now, the Imbrium Basin is a multi-ring basin defined by three concentric mountain rings with diameters of 342, 491, and 808 miles. The innermost mountain ring appears as a series of disconnected island arcs in the Sea of Rains. And from east, I'm sorry, from west to east, our chain tonight consists of Montes Recti, which is this little group of mountains that you see right here. That's Montes Recti. Montes Tenerife, which is this scattered group of mountains right here. And actually Pico Mons is that small one right there. Now the Strait Mountains, as they're known, Montes Recti spans about 60 miles with peaks up to almost 6,000 feet. The Tenerife Mountains consist of a scattered chain covering 113 miles, with peaks approaching 8,000 feet. Named Tenerife after the Canary Island on the Earth, it is spelled with an extra F to denote its rating on TripAdvisor for its utter lack of trendy coffee shops and reliable Wi-Fi service. <laughs> Just kidding. 
Pico Mons, which is one of my favorite little mountains on the moon, right here. Pico Mons finishes our island hopping excursion before heading back to the mainland. Its highest peak rivals those of Tenerife's, and it has a footprint of about 16 miles, the base of the mountain. Now, turning our attention back to the mainland, we see the Jura Mountains, which are right over here, showing up very well at this phase of the moon tonight. The Jura Mountains we see there in addition to the western end of the Alps, basically this region over here. These form part of a 490 mile wide highland uplift ring and Mari Imbrium's northwestern shore. Between 3.7 and 3.8 billion years ago, an asteroid impact formed the crater that would eventually be the Bay of Rainbows, also known as Sinus Iridum. So the, the Jura Mountains right here formed the western boundary of that ancient impact crater. Let's see this area as viewed from the northern tip of the bay called Laplace Promontory. I really like this view. Let me see if I can find it here for you. There we go. The bay measures 162 miles in diameter and its rim forms the Jura Mountains as we've already seen. Some of its highest peak towers over 12,600 feet above the Sea of Rains. The rough terrain surrounding the Bay of Rainbows is just the ejecta blanket from the impact itself. As lava began to fill the Sea of Rains, its enormous weight began to deform the lunar crust, tilting the crater inward toward the base and center and submerging its eastern rim. I always envision being in this position here hovering above the moon, getting these amazing views of the moon, something that I will never, ever be able to do. All right, before we move on, I want to check and see if we have a live moon. And you know what? We do. So I need to switch this view over to our live moon view. Hey, look at that. We have a live moon view. Let me do a few little adjustments here. That is a frozen image, so let me stop that. While I'm there, I'm going to load up our other telescope image. That's the one from the High Power Telescope. There we go. Now we're not quite in the right spot, so what I'm going to do now is move the telescope up toward the north. Try to match that view that we just had. We need to go a little bit to the west. There goes the Sea of Serenity and some mountains. And now we need to go purely to the west. And down, I'm gonna slow the motion of the telescope down a little bit for you. I will also brighten up that image. Give me just a moment here. Okay, let's get it a little brighter for you. There we go. Now the red areas that you see are not lava erupting onto the moon. Those are simply areas where the camera's pixels are saturated. I'm also going, going to adjust the contrast here a little bit. So what do y'all think of that view? Is it better than the fake view? Well, it's not really a fake view that we had before. It was a real view, but this is live right now coming to you from the dome. All right, let's see, where was I? Okay, looking east, at the low hills forming the Western Alps, our eyes are drawn immediately to the dark flat floor of the crater Plato. Plato is this big, big crater that y'all see right over here. That is known as Plato after the ancient Greek philosopher. Measuring 63 miles across and one and a quarter miles deep, Plato was once much, much deeper than it is today. About 2.8 billion years ago, lava began to invade the crater through its floor and then to fill it up nearly to its rim. So at one time, Plato crater there was much, much, much deeper than we see it today. That is definitely one of those craters that you could see with a pair of binoculars. 
All right, it's about time to move on to our next view tonight. And sort of in between this view and the next view, I wanna show you a little crater before we go all the way down south to where our next view starts. I wanna show you a crater that I like a lot. Now I have to find it here. It's not the easiest crater to see because it's really small. All right, now I have my reference points. The crater I want to mention is this one right here. Now you might ask, well, who cares? That's just a tiny crater. It's hardly even visible in this view. Well, this crater, it is small. It measures five miles in diameter and it's about one mile deep. Now this crater is special to me as it is named for McDonald's original benefactor, William Johnson McDonald of Paris, Texas, whose 1926 bequest literally put McDonald Observatory on the map. So that is McDonald Crater, everybody. Very happy to show you that. Now, while I am setting up for our next view, I want to show you this amazing view again from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter showing the area around Plato Crater and featuring some of the landforms tonight that we've already talked about. And you enjoy that for just a moment while I move the telescope to get to our next lunar view. Hopefully we'll have the clear skies persist. Everybody have positive thoughts, please, for us at this time. Not that that'll help, but it really doesn't hurt, does it? All right, I'm just about set up to show you all something really cool. One of my favorite craters on the moon making sure this image is gonna look just absolutely the best that it can for you. Okay, here we go back to the live moon. Let me get the pointer off there for you. Now we panned across the Sea of Rains and we now cross the Carpathian Mountains on its southern shore. The Carpathian Mountains is this group of hills right here. The Carpathian Mountains. Now most of the peaks in the Carpathian Mountains are relatively low, but at its western end, some peaks do tower almost 12,000 feet above the nearby terrain. To the east of the Carpathian Mountains, we see the foothills of the Apennine Mountains beginning to appear, and that would be this group of mountains over here. We've talked about those in former programs, so go, go back and watch some of those other ones. What do we have? Well, we have two large craters, this one right here called Eratosthenes, and the other crater over here, which is one of my favorite on the moon, called Copernicus. The crater Eratosthenes up here is 36 miles wide and 2.1 miles deep. It sits on top of the Apennine Mountains, so it formed, of course, after the Imbrium impact event that formed the Sea of Rains. Now, geologists would say that anything that happened on the moon from the time when Eratosthenes formed until just before the formation of Copernicus is said to be of Eratosthenian age. This spans a time frame of about 3.2 billion years and ended about 1.1 billion years ago. Now, craters like Eratosthenes appear fresh, but they lack the bright ray structures that younger craters like Copernicus have. There's a series of small central peaks in the crater floor of Eratosthenes that rise up to about three quarters of a mile tall. Now, both Copernicus over here and Eratosthenes are examples of what we call complex craters. The asteroid impacts that formed them excavated so much material and so quickly that their floors basically rebounded upwards following the impact. This formed a series of small mountains in the crater center that in some cases tower over a mile tall. Copernicus has a diameter of 58 miles and is 2.4 miles deep. Like Eratosthenes, it also has some central peaks that are about three quarters of a mile tall. Now I'm gonna tweak the image here. We are, I believe, getting some thin, yeah, I can see thin clouds there moving across the moon. I'm gonna try to brighten this up just a bit. Now look around Copernicus. You see all those wispy looking details there? Those are called rays and bright rays extend away from Copernicus, and those are the materials that were blasted out of the crater and deposited on the surrounding terrain. 
Now, crater rays are deposited around all craters, but as the surface ages, space weathering darkens their appearance. After about a billion years have passed, the rays disappear. Eratosthenes once had a ray system like Copernicus, but even though it appears somewhat youthful, its ray system has now disappeared. Let me do one little trick here to keep our telescope tracking accurately. All right, so you do notice the rays around Copernicus, but not around Eratosthenes. That is one indicator of their age. Okay, it is time, folks, to move on to our next field of view. This time I'm going to take you along for the ride, and we're going to go basically down the lunar terminator and investigate what we call our field of view number three. And I have a cheat map up here so that I don't forget what, A, where I need to be, and also the names of some of these features, because, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. Okay, we want that crater near the top to be just about in the middle of our view. There we go. Okay, we have arrived, folks, at our next stop on the tour. Southwest of Copernicus now, we have a pair of craters called Reinhold and Landsberg. Reinhold is near the top. Let me set our tracking rates here again. Reinhold is up here near the top of the view. Seeing some clouds moving across here is Landsberg down there. Now, Reinhold is the larger of the two. It has a diameter of about 30 miles. Reinhold falls into the same age class as Eratosthenes. Landsberg, down here below, is an older Embryum Age crater measuring 24 miles wide and also which has a depth of about 1.9 miles. Its central peak is about 1,000 feet tall. I almost said 1,000 miles tall. That would be a very tall central peak. 1,000 feet tall. Let's see here. East-southeast of Landsberg, we have the dual landing sites of Surveyor 3 and Apollo 12. And as you can see there, we're getting some more clouds. Y'all are not having positive thoughts for me. I'm turning up the brightness. If it gets really super bright, then I'll jump on it as quickly as I can and, and lower it back down. But we've now got the exposure time cranked up there quite a bit. Okay, so where did Surveyor 3 and Apollo 12 land? Well, they landed right about... Oh, in there. Actually, more like right there. Okay, Apollo 12 and, and uh, Surveyor 3. Now, NASA's Surveyor Program predated Apollo, and it was designed with three major objectives. One, to develop and validate technology for softly landing on the moon. Two, to provide data on the compatibility of the Apollo lunar landing spacecraft design with the conditions to be encountered on the lunar surface. And three, just to add to our scientific knowledge of the moon. On April 20th, 1967, Surveyor 3 became the second successful soft lander of the series to investigate the surface. The Surveyor program was enormously successful in preparing Apollo astronauts for their surface exploration. And there is the very bright moon. So let me turn that down just a little bit for you. Ewan Whitaker, with the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory back in the 60s, had pinpointed where Surveyor 3's landing site was and published it 17 months before Apollo 12's landing. NASA took that opportunity to make a precision landing at the Surveyor 3 site. On November the 19th, 1969, Apollo 12 landed 600 feet away from the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. Astronauts Pete Conrad and Alan Bean spent 32 and a half hours on the lunar surface. They conducted two extravehicular activities, EVAs, totaling almost eight hours. They also collected about 80 pounds of rock and soil and examined the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. They photographed and dismantled part of the spacecraft for later study, returning the samples on board their lunar lander, which was called the Intrepid. Oh my goodness, we have lost the moon. Let me check. Okay, well, we've now got larger clouds. It is 
going to be coming and going. I'm not sure we're going to get it back real soon. So if you will bear with me for just one moment, I'm going to bring back up our LRO image of the moon. I need to get it centered back where we are with our current view. Okay, here that comes for you. Now this is not the live view, again, this is the LRO view that we had used a little earlier. Let's see, where was I? Oh yes, very near Apollo 12's landing site, we find Apollo 14's landing site, which is right about up here. That's Apollo 14. Apollo 14 successfully landed north of the crater Fra Moro on February the 5th, 1971, aboard their lunar lander, which was called the Antares, named after a bright star in the constellation of Scorpius. Astronauts Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell performed the mission that Apollo 13 had planned before a failure and their command and service module suspended that mission while on its way to the moon. Apollo 13, great movie if you've never seen it, check it out. Stuart Rusa commanded the command service module for Apollo 14 and it was named Kitty Hawk. Shepard and Mitchell spent 33 and a half hours on the surface conducted two EVAs and collected 94 pounds of rock and soil samples. Well, let me check the moon again. We're getting close to moving to our next view and I'm still seeing a very cloudy moon over there. So we're gonna stick with our LRO view. Let's see where we are here. Oh, one of my well, I keep saying one of my favorite areas. I, as you probably determined, I have a lot of favorite areas on the moon. The area right around where Apollo 14 landed is near an ancient crater called Fra Moro. And it's in a deposit known as the Fra Moro Formation. Let me see, I'm, uh, I got ahead of myself here on the slides. Okay, well, that's our next view. Don't pay attention to what you see there on the left. Let's see, this area consists of broken rock fragments known as breccias, and they contain some of the oldest rocks known on the moon. Now, the formation itself is pretty easy to see. It is this area right in here, whereas the crater from Moro is really faint. It's like a, almost a ghost crater. We talked about ghost craters on Friday. Go back and, and learn more about those. But that's from Moro crater right there. The Framoro Formation, these materials were blasted out of the Imbrium impact event nearly 3.9 billion years ago. That's the, where we started tonight, the Sea of Rains. Some of those samples contain basaltic fragments that were 4 to 4.3 billion years in age, and thus far older than any collected at any other Apollo Mare site, where the Apollo uh, astronauts landed near the seas, not in the, the mountains of the moon. In 2019, geologists announced that they had found a 4 billion year old zircon mineral and a 20 pound Apollo 14 sample known as Big Bertha. The zircon likely originated on the earth in granite rocks and was delivered to the moon as a meteorite that was incorporated into Big Bertha. Now granite is a common rock on the earth. Look at the Texas State Capitol, it's built completely of pink granite. It's a common thing on the Earth, but not a rock that one would expect to find on the moon. The crater Fra Moro is a heavily eroded pre-Nectarian crater, which is 63 miles across and almost 3,000 feet deep. If you look right down below Fra Moro, we have two more craters. This one right here, which is known as Bompland, and this one to its east known as Perry. And if you look at Bombland and Perry and Fra Moro Crater, visualize them in your head for a moment. The trio sort of resembles the inverted cartoon head of Mickey Mouse. I can see that. South of the crater Landsberg, we see an isolated stretch of mountains known as Montes Riffius. Riffius. Right here, this is a group of mountains known as Montes Rufius. This range extends for about 100 miles with peaks up to about three quarters of a mile tall. 
Between Montes Rufius and Fra Mauro, we find Mare Cognitum. Mare Cognitum is this area right in here. Mare Cognitum means the known sea. This 234 mile wide sea was given its name in a proposal to the International Astronomical Union back in 1964 by former McDonald Observatory director, Dr. Gerard Kuiper. He was one of the primary leads on NASA's Project Ranger. They were a series of impact probe spacecraft designed to reveal the true nature of the lunar surface. On July the 31st, 1964, Ranger 7 became the first U.S. spacecraft to send back images of the lunar surface, revealing features as small as 16 inches across before it impacted the moon at high speed. The name Mare Cognitum thus is a testament to our discovery of the features of our once unknown neighbor's surface. Now I had intended to show you all another view of the moon tonight, not as extensive as what we've looked at so far, but because we've had some clouds and we've had to make some adjustments to our program tonight, that has left us short on time. But before we go to the Q&A, I did want to show you a video showing the region that we just talked about, including Copernicus up there on the limb, the edge of the moon, including Reinhold and Landsberg craters below, the Rafias Mountains, Bonfland Perry and Fra Mauro, Mickey Mouse, and the two sites, two Apollo landing sites in this region, Apollo 12 and Apollo 14. I hope you all enjoy that. Let me check to see if we have, we do, any amount of moon so that I can leave you, or not leave you, but do question and answer with you with a nice live moon in the background. There we go. And we'll just leave that up there. If something covers it, that's fine. I'm now going over to our uh, my chat that I see from our moderators in the stream tonight. And I'm going to answer some of your questions, just a few of them. We only have time to do just a few of them tonight. Let me get me back up here. Let's see, Doug White says, do you have any idea where Buzz Aldrin and his crew landed on the moon for the very first time? Well, gee, that's such a great question. I'll tell you what. Doug, I'm going to show you, since you asked that question and we have a live view of the moon up right now, and we're not far away from where they landed, I want to show you where they landed. We need to, ooh, that's really bright, isn't it? Let's turn that down just a scooch. There we go. All right, we need to go slightly north. We can get our telescope to move for us tonight. There we go. We're going to go north, and we're going to go over to the east a little bit. I'm looking for a feature that I always use. Okay, are you are you watching there, Doug? I want to show you where they landed. Specifically, they landed right there at the tip of that arrow. And I'll just leave that up there as I go back to my questions tonight. Let me get to that point. Okay, so yes, I do know where they landed. That's where they landed. Let's see, uh, Steven Yanakazawa says, what's the distinction between moon and moonlit? Uh, I think it's a matter of size. Um, it, if it were me making the definitions, which it is most definitely not, I would tend to say that anything that's a sphere, we can call a moon. Well, that kind of leaves out Mars's moons. And anything that is not a sphere is a moonlet. Uh, what makes the difference basically is mass. Above a certain mass, gravity forces you to be a sphere. So uh, anything above a certain mass pretty much has to be a sphere. Anything uh, significantly below that minimum mass can be whatever shape it wants to. So I don't know that that's a hard and fast thing. That's just kind of my, my definition. Uh, John Cetera says, is one side of the moon younger than the other side? Uh, well, yes, there are certainly parts of the side facing the Earth that are much, much younger than pretty much most of the backside of the moon. The backside of the moon does not have it, uh, well, it has a few, but not very many of those basaltic lava flows, which have occurred more recently 
that most of the heavy cratering occurred on the moon. And so, yeah, essentially those big dark patches on our side, the Earth side of the moon, are those younger parts of the moon. Oh, let's see. Stan T says, uh, is there a filter in front of the camera or is it just light being fed directly in? That's a very good question, Stan. Normally, if we're doing visual observations with our human eyes, we do want to have a filter in there because certainly through this gigantic 16-inch telescope over here, the moon is extremely bright and we do put a neutral density filter that blocks about 85 to 90 percent of the light in the bottom of the eyepiece there to make a more convenient view but i don't currently have any of those filters on my cameras because these cameras can go down to fractions of a millisecond in terms of exposure time and so i can always find a short enough exposure to uh to suffice without the need for a, a lunar filter in there Let's see, the last question we have time for tonight comes from Miles Groff. I, I think I've answered some questions from Miles before. Welcome back, Miles. Can planets ever lose moons? Could Venus and Mercury have had moons at one time that didn't survive? It, it is possible. The short answer to that, Miles, is we do not know. Uh, but we do know that there, uh, well, we don't know for sure, but there does appear to have been some migration of the moons, the shifting around of moon's position in the early part of the history of the solar system. And that could have ejected moons. It could have interrupted. It could have interfered, rather, with the orbits of, of moons of some planets. It depends on a lot of things. We don't know. But, but yes, in principle, it is absolutely possible that a planet could have moons, could have had moons in the past, and could have lost those moons as part of the formation, large-scale formation of our solar system. Thank you all for those questions tonight. I, as always, before I go, I want to leave you with a, a short list of resources about the moon. We're not going to talk about these tonight as we typically do. Just remember, you can go back and watch the stream, and you can always look these up later. Uh, very good resources to keep up with what the moon is doing tonight. And we're almost an hour in. We're, we're two minutes short of being one hour into our program tonight. So once again, I wanted to thank all of you for attending our programs. As I said earlier, we will shortly be doing a live solar viewing program with my, my colleague Joe Wheelock, one of my co-workers here at the Visitor Center. Uh, following that, we will have some more of our very popular live moon tours with Stephen Hummel. And those will start up within the next week or two. Keep our, your eye on our social media channels and our website for exactly when those will occur. And I wanted to finally thank all of you for helping to support us tonight. We appreciate you being part of our team here tonight. And we do hope to see you shortly in the future toward the end of July will be my next window for doing moon tours. So thank all of you very much. And this is Kevin. I'm out until later.